Um, welcome to the webinar regarding uh, ODAC uh, M2 matrix. Um, first of all, we started with a bit of delay, but no problem there. Um, just wanted to uh, uh, get thumbs up if audio and video is okay for you guys. So if you can confirm that. Okay, super. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. Okay, I think we can uh, go ahead with the presentation then. So, first of all, a welcome to you guys to this uh, webinar where I will try to explain um, more in depth the functionalities of the M2. We will look at some examples. We will uh, perform a live demo at uh, the end of the presentation where I will start touch and show you some configurations directly on an M2. Um, but first of all, we will give the presentation. Um, very big thank you to Sebastian who will uh, um, be present to answer all of your technical questions. I will be given the presentations. And I will look in the end at the chat box if I can uh, assist uh, some more. So let's get started. So configure your solution, part one, matrices. This presentation leads um, directly from the find your solution. And uh, it will be uh, given as a more, um, not quite technical, but more in-depth explanation of an M2 matrix. So. Off we go. Audio Gap 2 digital multi zone audio mixing system, which means it's a matrix um, where you have uh, the possibility for your inputs to mix them together and out to one or multiple outputs. So it's not a router, it's a mixer. Let's take a look at some key features first of the M2. So on board, we have a real-time clock. The real-time clock can be set manually uh, to be connected to your internal uh, time server on your network, or it can connect to the internet and get a timestamp from there. Make sure that your NTP uh, function is enabled on your network, so check your port settings if something goes wrong with the, the time sync. Mostly those problems are related to network issues. In case that there is no time sync, the M2 has also the possibility to run on an internal clock. So in case of sync loss, it will continue to update the clock. However, there is after a period of time, a small drift on that clock. So if you need precision timestamps, it is important that you have a very good um, network connection that you can sync from time to time to the real-time server. Besides that, we have ALC on the inputs, automatic level control. We call it level control, but it's better explained as an uh, AGC, automatic gain control, but we will look more in detail uh, later on. Possibility of phantom power on your uh, inputs, 48 volts. We have a three or seven band EQ. We have the possibility to add filters as well as your inputs and your outputs, meaning simple a high pass, a low pass, and a band pass filter. You can select mono stereo inputs. You have the possibility to program in the M2 four priority options, which have the highest priority in rank, to perform certain actions on your zone outputs or, uh, or other stuff. Besides that, there's also the possibility of a talk over functions on all your um, inputs. Besides that, on the outputs, it's possible to have multiple outputs linked together. So you have eight zone outputs and you can combine them. So each uh, zone will follow the other zone. 
were the possibility to link your inputs, your volume, and also define a volume offset between those zones. Besides that, scene selection. Scene selection, we will take uh, a deeper look into that later on. But in global, you can select local scenes, specify on one zone output, or you have global scenes that you can define that will take action on all your outputs. So you have both possibilities. You can define a max volume for each zone output to limit the volume. If in case you have multiple M2s, you can link them together through a fiber optic module. And you have the possibility to trigger voice files, which are stored on an SD card that you can slide in on your M2 in the SD card slot. Okay, that were some of the key features of the M2. More uh, in detail regarding the voice file settings, because we get um, quite a lot of uh, technical questions about it. People who try to trigger a voice file, which is not uh, successful. Let's say in 99% of those cases, it is always a problem with the format of your file. So it's very important that you store your message on the SD card in a specific uh, format meaning it has to be a WAV file, it has to have a bit rate of 16-bit stereo with a sampling rate of 48 kilohertz. Your file name cannot exceed eight characters, so limit plus the extension dot wave. You should store it on an SD card SDHC compatible and it should be formatted in FAT32. Most important is that the files you want to play are stored in uh, the messages uh, folder. So, um, if you follow that procedure, you will have no problems by triggering uh, a voice file. If we take a look at the um, interface of the M2 in touch. So this is a screenshot from touch, but I will show you later on how exactly you can find all your settings. This is your main screen. So in case you are not quite familiar by creating a dashboard, uh, later on when you start touch, this is a standard uh, layout that you can use to control your uh, M2. So in this case, we have an MT, uh, an M2 in the meeting room. That's the name of my device. I have my eight zone outputs. I have the fixing option where I can select all my inputs and define a pre configured uh, mixing setting for that zone output. Or I can select directly source at max uh, volume input on the drop down menu below. And on the bottom, you have your zone slider with VU information that you can use to adjust the output level of that specific zone. And on the bottom, you have your mute button to mute or unmute that zone output. On the top right, you have a settings button which you can use to access the settings of the M2. Now, let's take a look how that volume trigger uh, needs to be configured in the M2. Well, first of all, you have to define what file you want to play on a certain voice file setting. So you ha can have multiple voice file settings that you can trigger with multiple uh, voice files uh, attached on your SD card. You have to specify if you want to use that file and you want to play it. Well, obviously, you need to have a trigger for it. So in this case, you can specify whether it's triggered uh, by a contact, 
uh, where you can select if one uh, input of the M2 contact is enabled, then that force, force file should be played. You can define what to do when once your file is triggered, should when your trigger disappears, uh, if the message needs to be uh, played until the end, or you can define whenever the trigger disappears, you need to stop the voice file immediately. The fade speed defines uh, the speed when your uh, SD file stops that the original was that was playing comes back to that zone. And you can define a priority level. Since you have multiple voice file settings, you can uh, rank them in a specific order that in case two voice files uh, are triggered, that only the one with the highest priority level will be played at that time. Besides that, you have to specify if that voice file is triggered to which output it should play. So you can select output one, three, five, when a voice file is, for example, triggered. Voice file triggering. This is uh, very often used when you have pre-stored messages like uh, evacuation or uh, other messages. So, again, in this case, I have a 10 Hertz WAV file I want to play. So I have selected that one. Sorry. So I have selected that one. I select finish on release, phase speed one millisecond, and you specify your zone outputs. I'll show you later on. Uh, how to do that in uh, ODAC Touch. Okay. So we have voice files. Besides that, M2 timer settings, where you can uh, let the M2 uh, take some actions on predefined uh, dates or uh, at a specific time, uh, weekly basis, daily basis, you can program that. The action that you can do is change your routing, so you can change your source, you can change the volume, you can either disable or enable the muting of a certain zone, you can set the paging volume, you can switch relay on and off, remember that the M2 has also relay outputs on the back for each zone, you can switch them on or off, and you can play voice files that are pre-programmed. So remember that you can trigger a voice file by contact, but you can also trigger a voice file by a timed event. This can be done if you look at the settings of a M2 under the timer section, where you can see in this case, I have already programmed four events where you can see the date, time that it needs to be played, set routing to all, and root input 8 to output 4 and 6, meaning if this is enabled, this is the action that will be performed. Let's take a look at that. So, when you want to add an event, you can select either a date and time, or you can select a daily. You specify your set date, your set time, and the action you want to perform. So mute, unmute, play as the voice file. Again, I will show you later on how to do that. So voice file triggering, timed events. Other possibility we can do with the M2 is output linking. So remember the M2 has eight outputs. But in some cases, you want to combine them. Let's take a look at an example, where in this case, I have on the schematic uh, shown, I have two zones. So I have zone output one, and I have zone output two. These are individual meeting rooms or rooms, whatever you like to call it. And they're separated by a sliding wall. This wall can be opened, and when it's fully opened, it will trigger a contact. Now, let's assume that in this case, where in output one can play one source, 
and output two can play a different source, so they're listening to, to different uh, inputs. But in some cases, I want to open uh, the wall and I want to make it or create one big zone. That is here shown on the bottom. And each zone has an own wall panel that can be used to change volume, the routing, or other specific uh, programs. Well, in this case, if I want to make one big zone, I would like if somebody changes the volume or changes the input, that everything for those two zones come together. So when the wall slides open, I will trigger a contact and the M2 knows when this contact is triggered, it doesn't matter if I change the volume in output one, well, then the volume in output two should follow and vice versa. So actually what you do is you create one master zone. And on the other hand, you have slave zones that you can uh, let follow the master. In this case, you change volume, you change routing, everything follows, including your wall panels that will show the same status. So where this on top could be output one, input one, output two, input two, slide the wall open, contact closed. If I change this wall panel to input one, then this wall panel on the right will also show input one. So they follow each other. This is output linking. The way to do that is obviously in your settings of your M2, this is an output setting. So if you take a look at your output settings, you will see for each zone that is selected here. So sub is zone one, front is zone two, and so on. You will see for each zone the specific uh, settings you can do, like, for example, talk over, linking, max volume, tone, delay, filter, and wave tune. We will take a look in depth later on, but for now, what we want to do is linking. So I select the zone I want to link, in this case, sub. I select the linking button, which is now grayed out, meaning it's not active. I specify on the output linking of the subzone to which input it must be linked, or uh, I specify that the input needs to be linked, sorry, that the volume needs to be linked, and to which zone it needs to be linked. In this case, it could be, for example, zone front or right, it doesn't matter. And the trigger you want to use. Either you can have a constant linking, where you say, okay, this linking is always on, or you can link by contact. Output linking. Possibility to have scenes in your M2. Scenes, we talked about it earlier on. We have local scenes and we have global scenes. The main difference between the two type of scenes is that you need to remember that a local scene only take action on one zone where on the other hand a global scene can have uh, or can affect multiple zone outputs so a local scene affects only one output you can do mixing so a predefined mixing of all your inputs specified for that zone mixing it does not affect your uh, mass volume and you can have up eight scenes for a uh, output. Where, on the other hand, a global scene can affect multiple outputs. It can affect multiple volumes. Again, you have up to eight scenes. But you can also use as a source on that specific scene a local scene. It will all be clear when I show you uh, in real time later on. 
But for example, global scenes are often used, as you say, um, I have a contact and all zones need to be muted. That would be done on a global scenes because I can create a global scene where the action is mute everything, every zone, and the, the trigger will be a contact, for example. Again, on your um, main screen of your uh, M2, you can see the mixing possibility. When I click this button, I will get all my inputs that I can control. So meaning that in this case, I have, for example, scene one, scene two, three, and so on, or an input selection where I can, for example, specify for scene one that I want to um, have input one at minus 20 dB, CD input input two on minus 30, and so on. So this is a predefined mixing configuration for uh, one uh, output for one scene, local scene. Hope this makes sense to you guys, but I think with the real time later on, it will all be uh, clear. Where on the other hand, the global scenes is um, a setting that you can do where you can specify for all your outputs. So remember that for a local scene, I only had the option for one output. In a global scene, I have eight outputs at my disposal that I can take action on, where I can say I have a trigger and I want either for certain zones, no change, or I want to do something, I enable them and I lower the volume, for example, or I select another source. No change means that that zone will not be affected. If we took if we take a look at the global scenes, you can see as a trigger, I can use either contact triggering. And we added for the global scenes, we added also the possibility to trigger on, uh, on the flank, not on the flank, but you can specify if the contact is open or is it closed on the same contact. You can take action on that. Because remember, when you trigger a global scene or a local scene, whenever the trigger has appeared, you will go to the status of your local or global scene and you will stay there. So whenever your tr uh, trigger disappears, you will still have the setting of your scene. So every scene triggering, by contact for example, requires an other trigger if you want to go back to the previous state that it came from. That's something to remember. So once the scene is triggered, you will stay in that state. That's why we uh, have the possibility, let's say we trigger on contact one when it's on, the trigger comes, you go to your global scene, and when the trigger, the contact opens, contact one off, you can perform another action. In the past that was not possible because you needed another contact to do that triggering. That's why we added the on off status on your contact triggering. So in this case, we made, um, for example, output one, no change, but we enabled them to ZDB. M2 priority settings. As you all know, so who has the possibility to play a voice file. You can add a paging table, like an APM table. Or you can define four priority options in your M2. The four priority options in your M2 have the highest rank. So you need to consider when you have multiple um, uh, priorities, let's say you have a voice file you want to play, and you have an APM table, and you have um, the settings in your M2 enabled, that means that the voice file will always have the lowest priority. So if you play a voice file in a certain zone and you have an APM paging table that wants to page that zone at the same time, that the SD file will be interrupted. 
and your APM table will take over. On the other hand, if the priority ranking in your M2 is also defined and tries to do something on that zone, then it will override the APM table. So priority one, top, then priority two, three, and four, then the paging tables, and then you have your voice file on your SD cards in ranking of priority. To enable the priorities in the M2 web interface, not web interface and touch, you can select on the uh, system, on the settings priorities, where you see your four priorities. In this case, nothing is uh, enabled. You select one, for example, you enable it. You specify a trigger. You specify the input that it needs to follow with your hold time and your fade speed. And you specify the zones that need to be affected. Remember that an M2 can not only be triggered by contact, but can also use a source as a trigger. So let's say I have on input three an FMP40 module that gives the audio an evacuation message and I want to use that as a trigger I can specify by trigger for example input 3 or input 4 you can specify the level that it needs to reach before the trigger becomes active and you can use it to perform action Okay, so we have multiple M2s and I want to connect them. In that case, you need an optional OPT2 module, which is uh, the fiber uh, module, and you can link multiple M2s together. There is a limitation, however, if you reach the limitation, you will probably have a very, very big installation. So. There are limits, but in, 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 in practice, you will not uh, encounter them. So there's sufficient room to add multiple M2s. The M2, if it sends out the fiber link, you have to connect them and you have to remember that the link needs to be closed. So you have to go from one M2 with your link out to the next one, but you also have to come back. Fiber optic cable is multi mode, and you can send and receive eight stereo channels uh, from one M2 to another. In case you have a third one, you can send again eight fiber channels to the third one, but you can only send eight in total. You can go up to one kilometer from point to point. And in this case, you can send over fiber practically every input you have. So not only the eight balanced inputs, but also, for example, wall panel inputs. You can also send them over fiber. I will show you an example later on. Now, to understand um, how inside all the audio is processed and sent over fiber and priorities and everything, Let's take a look at the inside of the M2. So, in this case, I have three M2s linked together by fiber. This is inside the M2, where you can see fiber in, fiber out. This is your main DSP and FPGA processing where you have your tone, volume, delay, your communication and control, and the matrix volume for each zone. As you can clearly see, whatever comes in through fiber is first sent through your DSP and FPGA process. It comes back to the fiber module and can be sent out. So that means that if I, let's say, I have input one to eight coming in from another M2, I can use it as a source, and on the other hand, I can, for example, put new fiber channels from the second M2 on the fiber to the third one. 
So let's say here, this M2 puts on the fiber the A balance inputs. This M2 receives them. It listens or it uses only the four first one. On the other hand, this M2 can put four PI wall panel uh, audio inputs on the fiber channel. So this last M2 actually receives the first balance one of the first M2 and the first the four uh, wall panel inputs from the second M2. So you can do whatever you like. Remember that we talked about up to one kilometer point to point, meaning that the distance between this M2 and the second one can be 1,000 uh, meters. The second one, third one again, but we need to come back from the third M2 to the first one, meaning that this loop cannot exceed 1,000 meters. Because you need to have a section between the two, depending on how your uh, devices are set up on, on, uh, in the field. Remember, max 1,000 meters. In the ODAC uh, interface touch, you can see the fiber section in the settings menu where you can specify for the eight fiber channels what you would like to send out. Remember, if you use paging and you want to page over fiber, which is possible, one M2 with an APM tape connected, which I can use to, uh, to page to a second M2, which is located in another plant, I need to send it over fiber. That is always be done over fiber channel one. So remember, if you use paging, keep fiber channel one free. Do not put any other source on it because it will give a conflict with your paging setting. What can be sent through fiber, as I explained, of course, all your balance inputs, your line in number nine, your priority inputs. You can also send uh, a sine wave, white noise, pink noise, or your wall panel inputs. You can send them over fiber. Okay, again in detail, when we take a look at the M2 block diagram inside the device, we need to talk about this so you understand how the signals are uh, being processed inside the M2 without maybe going too deep in detail but you understand the architecture of the uh, M2. So let's take a look uh, inside. Of course, every device has a power supply. We don't need to talk about it. It's just a 24 volt line, uh, which on the DSP board is transferred to uh, five, uh, 3.3 and 1.2 for the DSP and FPGA. On them, you will see P1 through P10. These are the peripheral uh, inputs on the back of your device. So we call it the PI board with the 10 red RG45 connectors on. Where in this case, you have P1 to P8, which can carry audio and data. And P9 and P10 can only carry data. What can be connected to those PI ports? As you all know, APM tables, ARU units, the relay units, wall panels, uh, either the DW5066 with a display on where you can inject audio or the simple ones DW3020 just to control volume and routing. Very important to know when you make setups, is to know that between those PI ports can not be any data communication or audio communication. So you have to look at PI port as one individual input and you cannot route your data between the PI ports. Let me explain. I have an APM table. So I can page to my M2. And I also have your U want to address at the same time to switch on a light or something. That means if the APM table needs to address the M2 
and ARU at the same time, they need to be on the same bus structure. So I have to connect on, for example, P1, my APM table, and daisy chain my ARU at the same time. That way, when I push a button on my APM, I can address the M2 and I can address the ARU. What will not work is if I connect my APM table to PI port 1 and the ARU to PI port 2, I can never reach the ARU with my APM table because there's no communication between PI port 1 and 2. The setup that uh, often is a um, mistake and it will not work. Okay, PI ports. On the PI port comes out the 24 volt to supply your peripherals. You have uh, RS-485 data and you have your audio. On the balanced inputs, on the other hand, and the center board here, let's take first a look at the center board. As you can see on the M2 at the back, we had the fiber input. We have also the priority contacts inputs. We have priority inputs, audio. And you have the famous line 9 input, where you can see A, B, C, D on the back of the device, which is a selectable input. So you can only use one of those nine A, B, C, D input at the same time. These are injected into the DSP board for processing. On the other hand, you also have the output section here, the relay section. For each output, you can trigger a relay. Also here, on this case, um, the priority inputs are isolated from DM2 by an isolation transformer. For the balanced inputs, slightly different. You can see that when the signal comes in, it first passes the ALC. After that, it goes through the noise gate, where you enter your filter. Filter is low pass, high pass, band pass. From there on, you go to either your seven band, and from there on, the signal is processed by the DSP port for routing to different zones, for example. Whenever that is done and the FPGA gives your signal out, it will go to a tone control, again on the output, volume, delay, back to your filter, again, low, high, band, 7 band EQ, and then it's uh, given to the output of the M2. In case you have a POW2, an optional um, kit for uh, amplifier, you can build it in. It will follow exactly the zone output. Okay, let's take a look at the heart of the M2, where the DSP and FPGA uh, and your communication is, uh, is controlled. Um, where you can have your uh, firmware updates, your uh, software updates, uh, the real-time clock is on board. Uh, it will also handle all your fiber settings uh, and your communication to the outside, either RS-232 or TCP-IP controlled uh, by touch, for example. So this is, in general, the uh, inside of the N2, that you get an insight of how exactly the signals are being processed. OK, let's take a look at an example of a possible setup with the N2. In this case, setup. so I have one M2. I have my APM tables. The APM tables are paging tables to broadcast um, uh, announcements and they are connected to your PI board, your peripheral uh, interface board. I have a network connection that up to uh, Wi-Fi. 
I have an XMP44 with four source code modules installed to uh, inject audio in the M2. So I have a streaming module for internet, I have a Bluetooth module, and I have uh, uh, the MMP40 for playing music, for example. I have also, sorry, I've also connected other M2s by fiber. They're located, located in a different uh, rack, rack two and rack three, together with uh, other amplifiers, for example. So I can send over fiber either my sources from the XMP44 or I can page with the paging tables to uh, other M2s over fiber using fiber channel one. And on the other hand, we have the output sections to the different amplifiers to the different zones. So what is possible with this setup is that I can use these four APM tables and I, am, I'm, uh, I can give them priorities because I have four paging tables. I can uh, tell the setup, look, APM table one has the highest priority, then table two, three, and four. So in case that uh, different users want to page to the same zone at the same time, is the priority of the APM that defines uh, which one uh, will give them priority. So the lowest number has the highest priority. So this is a basic setup of, of an installation where you can uh, send and control multiple zones. This is for the M2. Okay. Now, slightly different, besides the M2, I would like to show you the difference between, for example, the MTX series. The MTX series, where in, in contradiction to the M2, where your signal uh, analog comes in in the M2 and is processed fully digital uh, inside until it's sent out to your zone output, is the MTX actually uh, an analog uh, device? Also, uh, um, for example, the differences in this case, it also has priority inputs, but only on the two first uh, microphone inputs. You have 15 volt phantom power. You can uh, select a three band EQ on your mic inputs, a two band EQ on the outputs. You can use it uh, as a mono or stereo uh, setup on your outputs. It has a 24 volt backup possibility and it has uh, a mute contact. Let's take a look at the rear panel. So I have my, again, my wall panel inputs where I can hook up my peripherals. I have the paging port for either an MPX table or an APM table. Both can be used on the MTX. Instead of the M2, where I, where I told you, if I let's say I have one wall panel connected to the input and I have uh, audio sent in on that wall panel, with an M2, I can distribute it to other zone outputs. For an MTX, is that not possible? Remember that for an MTX, if I inject audio on the first PI input, it will only be transmitted to that zone. I cannot route this audio to, for example, zone 7 or 8. That's not possible. But it has, of course, control RS-232. It has a TCP IP connection for your internet connection uh, in control with touch. You have your paging port for the, uh, for the APM table or the MPX table. You have four analog line inputs with the gain controls, and you have two microphone inputs that you can use as uh, priorities with their tone control, phantom power, and gain control. They can also be used as a line input with a fully gain closed. When you look at the block diagram of the MTX, it's slightly different. So as I told, all the inputs can be routed to all the zone outputs, but only the uh, peripherals that you hook it up are controlled only for that zone. So if I hook up a WLI or an MW, uh, MWX65 wall panel and I inject audio, that will only be routed to that zone output. 
Paging can be done in multiple zones. Controlled by TCP IP RS232 or RS485. On the end, at the zone output, you have your tone control and volume control. That in combination with your uh, web server uh, CPU and front panel controls. Where an M2 is fully controlled by uh, touch, so you in theory you do not have access to a front control on, on the M2 unless you build in an M2 disk. Uh, which is a, a screen display that you can use to control, is the MTX gives you the possibility to control it by front. If we take a look at the setup for an MTX, which is slightly different, of course, you can use, again, an XMP44. I have four zones, so I can send them to um, two amplifiers that control each in this case, two zones and one zone diner area upper floor. I have two wall panels connected to the PI ports where I can inject a uh, line or microphone audio. I can send it to the MTX48 and these two will only give an audio to that zone they're connected to. So this is a very basic um, setup. Okay. We talked about um, triggering from the SD uh, file on the M2. Well, is that the only possibility that you can use to, to play Messenger or whatever? No. In this case, I have an XMP44, and we also have the uh, voice file module for the uh, XMP44, which is called the FMP40. I will show it to you. It's an event triggering module with either uh, a built-in SD card, or you can use on the XMP, on the front, the USB stick to play your messages. So it's event triggering that can either be done by contact triggering. As you can see, I have um, 15 input connections, one ground and 15 uh, contacts that can either be defined as normal open or normal closed contacts and you can use them to uh, trigger the FMP40 to play uh, uh, a file, a voice file, or whatever. I will show you later on how this can be implemented together with the M2 to give the possibility, for example, to uh, play an evacuation message and use the priority to give uh, priority to this message. What it also can do is, besides contact triggering, is also event triggering by time and date. So you can program it uh, to have a scheduled uh, play. If we take a look at the XMP44 in touch, you can see all your modules that are installed. In this case, I have an FMP40 with version 112.49. This is a software version. And you can see it for every module that you know, OK, I know the software version, and I know what type of module is inside, and also in which slot it is uh, installed. Your XMP44 uh, version, and on which IP setting it is, uh, it is programmed. An event triggering can be done on the website of the uh, XMP44 because the website of the XMP44 is not uh, controlled by Flash, so you can still use it. And as you can see, in this case, I have my FMP40 settings with my contact settings uh, normally open or normally closed, whatever you want to define. And you have your events button that you can use to create an event. If you want to do that, you can enable your event. You can specify the file that it needs to play. If it's contact triggered, and in this case, maybe timed triggered, so the timer is on, with a certain priority level and the play mode you want to do. So you can either repeat your file uh, continuously, or you can play messages in a folder randomly. You can do whatever you like. So if I want to create one, I enable my event, I select either the SD card 
or the USB slot on front of the XMP44 with my messages stored. Again, very important, in this case for an FMP40, you can use either MP3 or WAV files. Uh, they need to be stored in the messages folder also, but in contradiction with the M2, you can play MP3s. So it's slightly different, easier. Okay, so in this case, enable event, storage on my SD card. I want to play Gong 1 MP3, triggered by contact 1, also by timer, priority level 1, and I want to select my play mode, repeat folder, while trigger is active. So as long as the trigger is, uh, is present, it will repeat the entire folder uh, until the trigger is deactivated. Okay, let's take a look at our matrix systems back again with the extra possibilities. What can we connect to them? Where do we need to pay attention to regarding wiring? Um, very interesting what we're going to show you now. So let's take first a look at the device. What is compatible with what? So we all know our matrix is digital M2 R2. We have our analog matrix MTX. We have the AMP523. We have the APG20 amplifiers, the LX523, the ARU, the relay module, and we have the AMP20. On the other hand, we have the peripherals, the, the WLI, which is actually a simple um, wall line input, so two uh, RCA connectors on, where the audio is transmitted uh, differentially um, to either uh, a device that is compatible. We also have that in WMI, which is a wall microphone input. We have the wall panels digital DW5066, that's a digital wall panel with a display and the possibility with RCA and uh, XLR input. We have the DW3020-4020, which is only a small device to change routing and uh, volume. We have the MWX65, which is the wall panel analog for the MTX. Then you have the small wall panel to change volume and routing the MWX45 for the MTX. We have the, our APM tables, paging tables. We have a WP523, which is actually the same as an MWX65, except there's no display. It's only an analog volume control. We have the paging um, tables for the MTX, which is the MPX4888. And we have our relay modules, the ARU2 series. As you can see, since the WLI and WMI are actually analog uh, inputs, they can only be used on an MTX and on an AMP523 and on an APG20. They cannot be used on M2R2 because an M2 and an R2, they expect a digital signal. That digital signal can only come from our digital wall panels. So the 5066 and the 3020, 4020, they are compatible with our digital matrix systems. We also have that for the MTX, which is the MWX65, and only change volume and routing, the MWX45. The paging tables can be used on all um, uh, matrices, so the digital as analog matrices. I will show later on because that requires a different setting in the APM table. Then we have the WP523, so simple wall panel to control an NLX523. And of course, your uh, paging tables, uh, which are designed for the MTX, can only be used on the MTX. It's the MPX4888. The ARU tables can be used on all our matrices. Okay, let's take a look at uh, the wall panel functionality. 
So we talked about uh, the DW5066 for the digital matrices, the DW30 and 4020, which only volume and routing, and we have the analog ones MWX45 and 65. So multi-zone only possible with your digital wall panel for the M2R2 meaning that in this wall panel i can select the output i want to control and i can uh, inject my audio and use it for all my zone outputs where on the other hand it can also be used as a single zone obviously on the other hand an mwx65 can only be used as a single zone. So it means that what I talked about, the PI port, if you hook it up to an MTX, it will automatically be assigned to that zone output. So you cannot route that audio to another output. Important to remember. Of course, the digital wall panel and the analog wall panel, they have audio inputs. They can be used as an audio output also, an input selection you can have on all your devices. Um, Cascadable only possible for the devices that carry only data, no audio. That's the reason you cannot hook multiple wall panels on the same PI port because you will get a conflict on your uh, on your uh, audio uh, bus. You can't do that. And on the 5066 digital wall panel, you can add a custom logo. Now let's take a look at one. So in this case, I have the 5066 as you know line in microphone in these two are locally mixed and transmitted over the bus to the digital matrix as a digital signal if you take a look at the mwx65 it will look exactly the same but it's analog audio so you can't use them um, on uh, an m2 for example Interesting in the DW5066 is that although the RCA input and the XLR input are actually used as an input with their individual gain controls, you can still use a 5066 as an audio output. So you can use either the RCA or the XLR as an audio out. Let's say you want to do monitoring or you want to add an extra zone output, you can use a wall panel for that. Although this requires a hardware modification inside the wall panel, which is fairly easy to do. I'll show you. Let's say I have a setup with M2 matrix. Think of it as uh, some bar or restaurant. Forget about the wall panel for this time. So I have two sources, I have multiple, uh, we forget the last one, we'll talk about this one later. So the standard set will be uh, in during winter and during uh, other periods of the year. I have an M2, two sources, two XMP44s and two m fires where I uh, play music inside my bar. Oh, summertime comes and I want to add an extra uh, zone output for the exterior where I can put another amplifier, for example. Um, I have another XMP, but I cannot get the audio from the matrix to that amplifier due to whatever restriction I have. There's no cable, whatever. But I do have a wall panel installed. In this case, I can program the wall panel as an audio out and i can use that audio out to route it to this amplifier and it will follow a certain zone of the m2 i have a schematic of the pcb if this goes too deep in detail don't worry because it is used from time to time and you have to to think of it as uh, some backup that you can use to make this uh, configuration it's fairly easy to do it. As you can see here, the two connections are actually the connections of the line input and the XLR input. 
So if you disassemble the wall panel, you will see that there are two wires coming from the RCA and the XLR. So they are signal wires and they're plugged in at two connectors on your wall panel. Now, if you want to use one of these as an output on the other side of your PCB, here you have a connector, which is line out and you can disconnect the connector here and plug it in in the audio out. And that way you have created an extra output on your wall panel. Now, this hardware modification is permanent, so it's something that you need to do. And you have to specify in your matrix that your wall panel is following a certain zone output. And the way to do that is, in touch, you can go to your output settings. Of course, you have your eight outputs, but you have also your wall panel outs. And if you go to your wall panel outputs, you'll see you have the same linking symbol as we talked about earlier on. And I can select here on your wall panel out one, for example, the linking, where I can specify that it needs to link the input and the volume to a certain zone. It can be either triggered or it is a permanent constant link that is always on. And you can specify a volume offset. So in this case, I have linked my input and my volume. I've linked it to output four with a trigger that is always on. This means that if I go to my wall panel, that the signal that is coming out, for example, here on my RCA, is actually a copy of zone output four. Not sure if that uh, makes sense to you guys, but uh, that is the idea behind it as a possible backup for the next zone output. Okay. So output linking for a wall panel. APM series paging microphones. We need to talk about that also because as I told earlier, it depending on the system that you use, we have digital matrices and we have an analog matrix or an ARU. If you have an APM table that you want to use, you need to specify in what mode to operate. And you do that by selecting jumpers, where you can see that analog paging or digital paging can be set up. So if the jumpers are located here, you're in analog paging mode. If you put them on G1, G2, you're in digital. So the audio that comes out on the bus from the APM can either be analog or it can be digital, depending on the setup you make. Bus termination, you can select by another jumper. More about that in a minute. So, if you want to use analog mode, you can control the audio. You can send it either to an ARU or to an MTX. You can use plain CAT5 cable or better, and you can go to 600 meter if you use an external power supply. Standard testing inside is done by 300 meter CAT cabling. We guarantee that it's uh, fully operational without the need of an extra power supply. If you go digital on an APM table, that means that the audio is transmitted in digital mode at a very, uh, at a higher speed than your data transfer. So for an R2, M2 possible, but you need CAT6 cabling or better. And you can go up to 300 meter with an extra power supply. So the difference, a lot of questions are, what is the maximum distance I can cover uh, in a setup that I make APM and a matrix? It depends, but these are the values that you can, you can uh, rely on. So analog mode, 600 meters, digital, 300 meters. The reason that digital can only go up to 300 meters is due to the fact that transmission speed of your audio is much higher in digital mode, of course, as an analog or as uh, uh, high differential 
uh, audio that's that analog. Now, for the need of the external power supply, again, if you use CAT cabling, you go 300 meter wide, you can, um, it's very easy to understand that an APM table one on one with one button and one LED consumes less power than an APM table with 16 buttons because this will draw more current and of course will have a higher loss of voltage over the cable. So there's no standard um, guide that we can do the distance that you can cover. In some cases, people ask us, okay, you specify 300 meters, will 400 meter work? It depends on your setup. If you have one at APM table, one, one at the end, I assume it will work. If you have on your bus, like four or five APM 116 uh, tables at the end, it will not work. So the power loss is too big and it will create all kinds of uncertainties on the bus. Also to remember is when you make a setup like this, is that when you hook it up, you will always uh, have to make sure to avoid any store structure. Meaning you, uh, you leave the M2 with your CAT cabling, you come to your first APM table, uh, you put an intersection there to go to a second APM table. Well, keep the distance between the tables uh, at the intersection as short as possible to avoid bus bouncing. Bus bouncing uh, be avoided by uh, creating power structure and on the other hand by carefully uh, placing your wires and thinking about uh, keeping the, the, the cables at the, at the intersection as short as possible. However, our field technician, which is a very clever guy, he had never encountered a problem in the field where he could not solve uh, the problem of bus bouncing. So uh, uh, we have uh, been installations that uh, where all the cables came uh, from all sides at one point. So uh, there was a lot of bus bouncing, but by adding extra power supplies, by adding um, multiple uh, ARG uh, uh, connection blocks, with bus station, he could always solve the problem. So don't panic if your wiring is not 100% okay. There are always possibilities to, to solve that one. Now, if you need to go digitally further, you will need or you can use a repeater to extend your range. Without a repeater, it's 300 meter max due to the fact that your audio is transmitted digitally. Okay, inside an APM table, we can use uh, the APM table to upload messages. So in this case, you need to specify the message format. It should be a WAV format, 16 bit, 12 kilohertz mono. And you can, it's limited to 600 seconds or uh, 30 messages. Whatever is reached first is the limitation. You can use it either on an APC and with an APC 100. You cannot use it on an MTX. So APM messages need to pro be programmed um, with uh, ODAC uh, system manager and you need an APC 100 to act as a between your APM and ODAC system manager. The APM 100 uh, Sorry, the APC 100 is a very clever device. You can use it as a, a monitoring tool on the bus. You can use it either to update your wall panels, to update uh, your APM tables, to make an offline configuration. So this is a very handy tool, what uh, you really should have when you do troubleshooting in, in the field. It can also act as a master clock for your system. If you want to use it as a master clock, it needs to be fixed inside the project. It will synchronize to the internet again uh, as an NTP server. Now, let's take a look at ODAC uh, System Manager. In this case, you will still need ODAC System Manager in certain cases. 
because we focused on the migration from Flash to uh, Odak Touch. All the functionality that was uh, limited to Flash has been uh, converted into Odak Touch. And the settings and programming that can be done by Odak System Manager will uh, still exist. You will still need Odak System Manager to make certain configurations. Odak System Manager for you guys probably uh, familiar, but I will give uh, a brief explanation. So what it actually does is it discovers your uh, devices inside your network. It will come up with the IP address and the type of the de device. Um, if it's in range with your local uh, network, it will be shown in blue. If it's a red, it indicates that your um, IP setting is out of range and you cannot control device. If let's say in this case my M2 on IP 10236, I can see the hardware address, I can see the firmware, the CPU, and the FPGA version. Whether there's an update available or not, I can update my device. I can extract the settings of my device. I can import uh, a certain set setting file. So whenever you make a setup in the field, make a backup of your settings, keep it stored in case uh, you need to replace the M2, that you will not need to reprogram the entire M2, just load your settings file and you're good to go. On the right, you can see we have other firmware versions available for your uh, device, for example, M2, R2, MTX, uh, as well as for your wall panels, uh, the XMP44 and its modules, they're all located in uh, System Manager. You can also use it to discover your peripherals and program, uh, let's say, for example, an APM table that is discovered. An APM table that is discovered can easily be configured by System Manager. If you take a look at the uh, configuration of an APM table, on the top you see your connected devices. That means if it's uh, inside your installation, you can immediately see all the devices that are at that point connected to the bus. In this case, M001 and R001. If you need to add a device which is not in your configuration, but you still want to use it to program your APM, you can add a not connected device. Let's say I want to also add uh, an ARU, uh, you can specify it here. Important to know, like when uh, we talked about the uh, connections on the PI board, where I explained to you that there's no communication between the PI ports uh, independently, that's very important that you need to specify your APM table to what port it is connected to. In this case, it's PI port 1. If I do not do that, the audio will not be submitted um, to the appropriate uh, zone setting. Specify your priority for the APM table in case you have multiple. You can select your volume, the chime volume, and if there's a uh, time server inside your network where it needs to receive the clock from. So an M2 can act as, uh, uh, as a supplier for your clock. An APC 100 can. Besides that, you have your virtual buttons that you can program. More on that later on. And your uh, physical buttons that you can program. Besides that, you can save your configuration to a file. You can load it from a file. You can upload it to your AM table. You can create time events, or you can do a complete erasure of your configuration. Let's take a look. So button 000, I can make a zone select. If I select zone select, I need to specify for what device, on what output. I can select a play message the ding-dong chime or no message at all, or pre-stored message that you uploaded, the evacuation or a message. You can add a push to talk button. You can toggle a relay 
of the M2 or an ARU. You can pulse a relay. You can select a layer. You can uh, play an M2 voice file under a button, or you can group buttons. Important to know in the structure of your bus, if we go back, you can add here multiple devices, of course. So the APM table is not limited to one device. It can either address an M001, and it can also address an ARU. Important to know is that all the devices that it's connected to need to respond. So what happens is when I start an APM table to do a paging, it will start to communicate with the devices. In this case, it will talk to my M001. That M2 needs to give an answer back. And from that point, when the APM table receives the acknowledge of your uh, matrix, that it will start to transmit uh, the paging message. If I have a second device, let's say an ARU, that I also want to trigger a relay, and the ARU unit is faulty or it cannot respond, your paging will not work. So you would assume that if I have an APM table and I address a matrix and I address an ARU, in case one of those two devices fails, that the other one will still operate. No, it's a kind of a safety that in this case, if one of the uh, uh, devices on the bus is not responding, nothing will happen. And your enable or your communication LED on your APM will uh, start to blink, indicating that something is wrong on the bus. Somebody is not answering. So for troubleshooting, it's very easy to see which device is not uh, responding. If you take a look at, for example, um, in this case, um, a zone message I want to play, in this case, play message. So I configured my button 00 as a zone select, button 1 as a play message. What I can do now is add a virtual button to that specific um, uh, action. So either you can program your buttons as a physical button, like push the button and behind it is a program that is executed, or I can create virtual buttons that I can group. In that way, I can add multiple buttons under one physical button. So let's say I have a virtual button created for a zone select, I have a virtual button created for a play message, and I want to use physical button 8 as a group button that will perform uh, virtual button uh, 0 and virtual button 1 to do that action. In that way, I can group my buttons as um, uh, button number 0 as a zone select, the virtual button as a play message, they are programmed under button number eight. When I push button number eight, those two actions are executed. Okay. Besides that, as I told you, you can also use an APM table as a, a device to play messages at a certain time. Let's say I have um, an information message stored in the APM and I want to play it at a certain time. I can use timed events on my APM table to configure them. I can choose whether I would like uh, an event to play at a certain time or repeatedly after a certain uh, amount of time. So if you take a look at it, let's say I want to program event number zero, which will start on um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, weekly days, at 8 o'clock. And I want to repeat it every 60 minutes, again on those days, until 12 o'clock. And I want to trigger uh, the virtual button 0 and virtual button number 1. Of course, if you use the event config, 
later to, to do uh, those actions on the APM table, it needs to be virtual buttons because an event cannot trigger a physical button. That's why you need to create the virtual buttons. But you can practically put everything under a virtual button. Second possibility in this case is I specify, specify sorry, a certain date that it needs to start and an end date, and again, every interval of 60 minutes, the message needs to be played. So I do a zone select and I play a message. Remember that uh, playing a message as the first button will not work because first you need to do a zone select. Your matrix needs to know to what zone your message needs to go. So if I select only virtual button zero, one to play the message, and I do not specify a zone select, it will not work. So nothing will happen. So first of all, make your zone selection to, for example, output one. I want to play that message. So that's important to, to know that it will work at that point. So an APC 100 can be used as a bridge between your APM table uh, in ODAC system manager to do the full configuration of your APM table, but it can also be used as a bridge between an uh, IP uh, command to an RS serial 232 command. Let's say I have an amplifier, an SMQ or a PMQ, I want to control it by serial command. By touch, I would need an APC 100 to make the bridge between the TCP command and my serial command. On the other hand, you can use it as uh, a tool to program your APM or to use it as a clock for time events. So that's where the APC 100 comes in. It can do a lot more than that. You can also use it as a monitoring tool when you use Docmite, for example. You can see what's happening on the bus, all the commands. So it's actually also a listening tool for your uh, RS485 bus. Okay, besides that in System Manager, where you have your configuration, your update files, um, to scan your devices in your network, it also has the Wave Dynamics Configurator on board. I will go briefly into that. It gives you the possibility to, for example, select your device amplifier, let's say PMQ 600, and you know you have uh, on your uh, PMQ certain filters enabled and this is a flat uh, filter so nothing is uh, is programmed but i can for example select a speaker file like the ateo 6 that, that i can load into let's say channel one my amplifier, and i do that it will give me the setting for an ateo 6 on channel one on my pmq 600 so that's how you can configure your amplifier by uh, Wave Dynamics in, in uh, ODAC System Manager to give the proper setting for your speaker setup so the amplifier knows load uh, it's driven. Okay. The question we get a lot is, can I page multiple MTXs by an APM table? Um, in theory, no. Why not? Because every device has a hardware address. So in case of 2, you have, for example, M001. You can specify it as an M002, 3, 4, and so on. The hardware address is important because if you link multiple M2s by fiber, you would need to have a unique address for each device. So your first one, M001 second one M002, and so on, and so on. However, for the MTX, it's not possible. The MTX has always hardware address X001. If I have multiple MTX in my network, they all will have hardware address X001. Meaning that if I try to connect an APM to address X001, on multiple MTXs, it will give you a conflict because the APM table will send out a command 
you have two, three, or four empty access responding at the same time, all with X001. So the APM table doesn't know what to do because it receives multiple uh, uh, acknowledges. So in theory, not possible. However, if you use a setup with two MEXs and two ARUs, I can use one APM table to page to uh, every MTX in the MFP. This is done by selecting the APM table and addressing proper relay. So what we've done here is we have our source here inside the MTX. We have the output zone outputs of the MTXs. We go to a relay unit. In this case, it's an APM 204, where relay is used to route out the audio. So you will need to see the ARU as a switching contact between either the audio from your source or the audio from your APM table. <clears throat> and the only thing the ARU does is it switches between audio from your source or audio from the APM and it feeds it into the amplifier. That way we can program the APM table to address the ARU and not the MTXs. What the APM does is simply switch the relay to route the appropriate audio to the specific zone. I don't need to switch all inputs. If I say I want to use the APM table to switch relay zone output one, and my paging will only go to one and two and three will still be playing the audio from the source. So this is a nice setup for uh, using an APM table to control uh, multiple uh, MTXs. Okay, now, the position is complete. If you want to stay up to date, visit our uh, website and in uh, some cases visit the portal for more technical information or contact the support channel if you need more information.